vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be of good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy, greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved. Let them, or then let them, use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how, knowest how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the wor world, and received up into glory. Those 16 verses have oftentimes caused many people to be upset. In the book of Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men for and I shall not be the servant of Christ. In Galatians chapter 4, 16, he says, Am I therefore become cause I tell you the, and here's the word, truth. When it comes time to appoint men as elders, as deacons, sometimes there is a little bit of controversy among the people. There are many people who desire the office but do not meet the what? Qualifications, right? There are many people who would love to be uh, an elder or a deacon, but yet when you look at the qualifications, they just do not meet those qualifications. As we look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, I would like for you, if you would, to please place your ribbon or marker there in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and open your Bibles to the book of Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27. Leaders are important and always have been to God. When we look at Numbers chapter 27, beginning with verse 15, And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in. In the congregation of the Lord, be not as, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man who is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight, and put, and, and thou shalt put some of the, thine honor upon him that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word shall they come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him. And he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation and he laid his hands upon him and gave him charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Even in Old Testament times, even under the law of Moses, we see the importance in God's eyes 
of the children of Israel, if you will, a leader, someone who would go for them, someone who would be an example to them, who would, and here's a very important word, lead them, lead them by example. Oftentimes, there are many people who want to be an elder, but yet don't like the leading. They desire, but yet they do not hold and have the dedication to follow through with the work. And that's precisely what that office is all about. It is about W-O-R-K, work. It is not an office just to hold an office. It is an office of labor. If you will now turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And as you're doing that, as we look in the pages of our New Testament, we see in the book of Acts chapter 11 and verse 30, the first time, the first time that we read about elders in pertaining to the eldership of the Lord's church. Eldership is vitally important, vitally important. We look at scriptures such as Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Take heed to thyself and to all the the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Elders are feeding. You see, the word bishop here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is the Greek word presbyteros. There is another word, or actually two other words, that, that are pertaining to the same office. You have the word poimain. Poimain. So presbyteros and poimain means shepherd or also to feed. And then there is also the word episkopos, which is overseer. And that word is bishop. I'm sorry, the episkopos is, is bishop. So you have the word elder, which is presbyteros. Now, as we look here at 1 Timothy chapter 3, I want us to notice some things. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. First, I believe there needs to be a desire. Now, this is not necessarily a qualification per se, but I believe this is vitally important. You know, I have heard of circumstances by some brethren who begin their work, and they begin their work at a congregation that does not have an eldership. And he'll go into that work longing wanting to work toward an eldership. That's wonderful. That's the way it ought to be. You know, when we look at Acts chapter 14 and verse 23, we see what the apostles did. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord to whom they believed. It was vitally important, even in New Testament times, if at all possible, if the men met the qualifications to ordain elders, elders in every church. Now, I have heard of people saying, you know, this man, I believe, meets all of the qualifications, but he just doesn't want to be a leader. Maybe he knows something you don't know. He may say, you know what, I'm, I'm a better follower. I do not want to lead. It may be the case that he can teach class pretty good, and, and he may be able to teach others the plan of salvation, and yet sometimes he doesn't want to be out front. He doesn't want to be the person that people come to, and he doesn't want to lead them in and, and, and lead them out and bring them in. It may be the case that he just doesn't have that desire. Now, we can, we can encourage somebody and hope and pray one day he will, will, he will have that desire, but friends, if he doesn't hold that desire, and I want you to listen very carefully to what this word means. This word desire in the Greek, it means this to set the heart upon, to long for. It is a good, good work or valuable or, or virtuous work, but it's to set the, the heart on. Now listen, oregatai, to stretch one's self out in order to touch or to grasp something, to reach after, to grab. Here's an individual in 1 Timothy chapter 3 who has prepared himself. Somebody told me the other day, that I have prepared myself and I have been preparing myself to be an elder one day. That's admirable. I think men who want to lead, who want to teach, who want to be an example, who want to do that work for the Lord, that is a great thing. You know, it's been a few years ago 
I did not desire the office of an elder. But you know what? The older I get, the more I see that there is a need in the Lord's church for good, faithful elders. Because there are so few, and we'll get to that in just a moment. And when we look at this, it is something to be longed for, something to be grasped after, desired. This is a true saying, if a man desire or regatai the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work, an excellent work. This is not an office just to hold office. I have heard other individuals say, well, this man is a manager at the local uh, store. He has people under him, and I believe because of that, this man would make a good, what, elder. Oh, look, look how he manages the store. Look how he's so good at this. He, he's a good leader. Well, he may be a good leader at the Piggly Wiggly. He may be a good leader at Walmart. But does, does, the, that, does that mean that he's going to be a good leader in the Lord's church? It doesn't. He may have some kind of leadership skills, but there are qualifications here, and it's a good, good work. When we think about the work of the eldership, number one, we've already looked at one, to feed. To feed. It, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. We beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and are over you and admonish you. Did you hear the word labor in there? To know them which labor among you. This is not just an office to hold an office. This is not uh, something that this is uh, something I'm going to long for, I'm going to shoot for, now I'm going to sit back and relax and I'm going to give orders. This is an office of labor. I open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. And when we look at 1 Peter chapter 5, you're going to know some things here as well. And by the way, the three words that I mentioned earlier are all here. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, The elders which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder, that is, Peter was what? What was Peter? He was an elder, right? And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but... Here's the word I want you to look at, willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. These men labor, 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and they labor and work willingly. I talked to an elder just a few days ago. He's one of the busiest elders that I know. He was setting up Bible studies and conducting Bible studies in his home as an elder. He wasn't waiting on the preacher to set those up. Too often, the finger is pointed to the preacher. We have a problem in the Lord's church today, and it's called the pastor mentality. So many times, and this happened at McKaysville, for the longest time, Brother Bill Johnston was our minister. 37 years, but you know what else he was? He was an elder. Everyone was used to going to Bill and, and telling Bill and asking Bill for permission. Well, Bill retired, and Bill left McCaysville and went to Central in Cleveland, Tennessee, and is now their associate minister. Well, guess what happened when Bill left? Who did people begin to go to? Me. Can I do this? Can I have your permission to do this? What do you think about us doing this? And guess what I said? You need to talk to the elders. You know what one lady told me? She said, I don't know why you're like that. We always went to Bill. I said, yes, but Bill was a, an elder. And so many times in the Lord's church, we have what is known as the pastor mentality. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, let's look beginning in verse 2. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, 
apt to teach. When we look at these, I want us to note something. The word must, and if you do not have it underlined, please underline that word in verse 2 because everything that follows is a M-U-S-T. It's a must. It's not that the first one is a must and the rest are, rest are not. Each one of these is a must. The bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality. What does given to hospitality mean? You know what this one elder I was telling you the other night about? When I spoke to him, he was inviting the people in his home. He and his wife were having them over for supper, then having a Bible study with them. When people come to do gospel meetings, guess what this elder and the other elders do at this particular congregation? Would you stay with us? They don't put them up in a hotel. Would you come and stay with us? We want you to hospitality. They were inviting. And when we look here at the last one, apt to teach, here's oftentimes where we get so many times, not just often, but so many times, get into trouble in the Lord's church. The word apt means skillful in, in the Greek. That word means skillful in. It doesn't mean that, okay, here, you know, I'll, if the time arises and this brother's not here and this brother's not here and this brother's not here, then, you know, <clears throat> maybe I'll say a few words. Apt means skillful in teaching. If you're going to lead the congregation, you have to be someone who is knowledgeable enough as we look in Titus chapter 1, and if you will, by verse 2, would you please put Titus 1, 7 through 11, and underline verse 11. These men must be knowledgeable enough to stop the mouths of the gainsayer. Now you think about this just for a moment. Someone who is teaching false doctrine, if they were to come through those doors... If they were to come through the doors at McKaysville or wherever, and they, during the class period, or they raise their hand and they begin to teach false doctrine, the elders are the ones that need to be able to stop their mouths. They have to have the biblical knowledge and the wisdom. You know, we look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, For when for the time ye all teachers ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not me. Friends, if that applies to us, that applies to us, it would apply to these men who would seek the office of the eldership. They must be men already have the application of having biblical knowledge. This, as you go on down, not a novice. What is a novice? What is that talking about there? Somebody answer that for me. Not familiar? What about a new convert? What about somebody who's a new convert? Somebody who is on the milk and not been on the meat at all? A new Christian. These men need to be seasoned men, knowledgeable, being able to teach others, to lead others, and to lead them in the right direction. Too often, people get a little overzealous and they'll say, Oh, what a good man this is. How long has he been a Christian? Oh, about two months, three months. Let's put him in as an elder. I like the way he thinks. He's a babe in Christ. He's a babe in Christ. We have a problem there. You know, when we think about out to teach, there was a man a few years ago who came to McKaysville. And I would see this man going to the sides and talking to other people after I preached. And I didn't know what he was talking about, but I would see him. And when I would walk by, and I did several times on purpose, he would get quiet. Well, I knew he was either talking about me or something that I had said behind the pulpit. It was way too obvious. Well, these individuals came to me, and they said, you know what he's saying? You need to watch out for this guy. He, he's saying that miracles still happen today. He, he's also saying that, that the devil still possesses people today in demon possession. He, he says that, that it's okay to drink wine as long as you do not get drunk. He, he says that this is okay. And, and he was and every time that you mention any of these things, he's going and saying, have you ever considered this? Or have you, have you ever reasoned about this in, in conjunction with this scripture? So he was twisting the scriptures, but yet he was also striving and trying to pull people away. So 
Did I go to him personally first? No. Was that my job? Whose job is it to close the mouths of the gainsayers? It's the elderships. I went to the elders. They said, would you come in the meeting? I said, absolutely. I went in there with him. He also believed in the Bell's position of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Found that out too. And that's the one he was really hot and heavy on. You know what the elders told him? They said, you're not allowed to teach any of those things on this premises any longer. That's it. And if we find out you are, we'll have you removed. And they said, not even in our parking lot. He said, this is a dictatorship. And I'll never forget what one of our elders said. He said, no, this is an eldership. And you're not allowed to teach those things. I was so proud of those men. That's what it is. When you, and when you look at apps to teach, that's why it's so vitally important, skillful in teaching. Now, that's not saying they are in need of getting up and, and preaching, but they are capable to do. They're skillful in it. They can teach whether it's a private Bible study. They can answer questions. They make comments in class and maybe even spend a few minutes in class in a comment. It's a lot more than teaching a children's class. You know, there are some people, and I remember one guy that wanted a man to be a deacon so bad and even an elder. He said, I'll tell you what, I have to teach... You teach the uh, three- and four-year-olds. Friends, that's not what it's talking about. These men must have the biblical knowledge to stop the mouths of the gainsayers. There's so much more we could say. We're already about out of time. I want you to look, if you will, on down now, and let's, let's concentrate a little bit as we have about five or six minutes left on the deacons. As we look at the deacons, beginning with verse 8, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given too much wine. Is there a difference in, in what it says here uh, pertaining to the deacons and the elders or the bishops? The bishops, it says, not given to wine, verse 3. Here it says, not given to much wine. Let me ask you a question. Does that, does that give the deacons a little bit of permission? <laughs> a little? <laughs> Ron says a little. <laughs> A little bit of permission. Now, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't give them any. Open your Bibles, if you will, and before you do that, right underneath that verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 17. Ecclesiastes 7, 17. Please write that under that verse, and please open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and let's look at verse 17. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 17, I have 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 3. Be not over much wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Be not over much wicked. Does that mean that they could be a little wicked? No. No, it's not giving permission to a little wicked, and it's not giving permission to drink a little wine. It's not giving any permission at all. It's saying the same thing as it said in verse 3. Not given to much wine is not given to wine. As we look at the book of Ephesians chapter 5, and you might want to put Ephesians 5 and verse 18 under 1 Timothy 3, 8 as well. And this is something I want to do because I'm just kind of hitting some points I've heard and some arguments I've heard in the past. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In the Greek, that literally means do not even begin the process of being drunk. Don't even take that first drink. I remember in high school, my science teacher was an atheist. He was an atheist, but he did not drink. He did not drink. And I thought, well, why in the world would a man... But he saw the downfall. Even as an atheist, he saw the downfall of it. And here's what my high school science teacher said. I'll never forget it. His name was Dick Key. He said, the first, very first sip you take, you're one sip intoxicated. You're one sip drunk. That begins the process. And he told us how many brain cells that that actually began, began to kill. Just one sip. And he said, then two sips, then three sips. Drunkenness is a process, and friends, it begins with the very first sip. And don't let anyone say about 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8 that that gives them 
the permission to have a little bit. It doesn't. It gives them no permission at all. It's saying the very same thing as it is in verse 3, not given to wine. So please write Ecclesiastes 7.17 and Ephesians 5.18 below that verse. As we look on, the deacons, the qualifications are very similar to that of, of an elder. Oftentimes, men serve as deacons and later become what? Elders. And, and so we've had that before at McKaysville. But I want us to finish with verse 15. Uh, there's just not enough time to go through this. It's, a, it's, it's quite astonishing. I've, I've been looking at the clock and I thought, wow, I just do not have enough time. But verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of, of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. When we think about the Lord's church, when we think about the, the, uh, the plan of the Lord's church, when we think about the pattern of the Lord's church, the Lord has put in place certain offices. The elder, the deacon, some are ministers, but we all have a part. Every minister. When you look at that language in the book of Acts chapter 8, when the church was under persecution, and they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Everyone has a part to play. Those men that are called elders have a part to lead. It's a part of work. It's a part of laboring. And it's a part that needs to be taken very seriously in each and every qualification met. Same thing with deacons. And then when we look at the Lord's church in verse 15, we see that it is the pillar and the ground of the truth. People ought to look at us in the world outside and say, what is so different about that church? There's some religious bodies that say, well, we have deacons, but we have no elders. You know what? We have elders and we have deacons. Your deacons are taking on the actions of the elders of the Lord's church, but that's not scriptural. They're not leaders. They're not overseers. When we look at the pattern and the plan of the Lord's church and the offices, we need to be a shining example and be a pillar and the ground of the truth. You think about pillars and ground. We're to hold God's word up and be an example to the world around us. Any comments in closing? It's 15 till. I got five, well, hey, five minutes. You said 15 till. <laughs> Are there any comments? No? That's the first time I've ever heard that. <laughs> it's astonishing because this is a true saying, if a man, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he must be. And, and so it, it's, it's, it singles them out there. Um, when we look at scriptures such as Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, I believe some brethren have it right when they say this seems to be almost the first time or first instance that we have deacons in the Lord's church. You have men that were appointed to serve tables so that other men could do the preaching and the teaching and converting. And uh, because men seem to be bogged down. When we look at Acts chapter 15, verses 2, 4, 6, and 22 through 29, we have the eldership mentioned in with uh, the apostles there oftentimes. And so uh, these two offices need each and every qualification needs to be met. But I have never, ever heard that H. Leo Bowles believed that. That's a, quite astonishing to me. Yes. If I were to ask you how many children do you have and you only had one, would you say I have one children? It would be one child. And children pertaining to one or more 
Um, in the Greek there, it doesn't give a, uh, does not mean uh, the plural. It necessitates how many ever is under his house. As long as he rules his own house well, uh, and that's what that's pertaining to. But I have one child. I've known, I know many good elders that have one child. And some have more than one. Uh, but it's, it, it, it's the, the way the word is used there is the same way if I were to say to someone who had one, how many children do you have? They couldn't rightfully ask, even grammatically, it wouldn't sound right, how many child do you have? How many children do you have? And that's the way that word is used in that passage. So how many ever it is, this man has control of his house. And, uh, and you know, we've gotten into trouble with that too. You, you know, you think about how many men whose, uh, whose children, whether it's one, two, or three, or four, and his children are not in control, his children come in just in time for Bible class. They may leave before the invitation is given, and then in the community, they are known to be riotous. They're known to be children who are not faithful to the Lord, and he does not have control of his children. But yet, oh, he meets all the other qualifications. He's such a good teacher. Uh, he's such a faithful man, but he's not qualified. You see, each and every qualification must be met. Um, I know of a man who was once a deacon, and this man, it got back to me, was known to be a slanderer, was known to love to argue with people all the time. And they said, you know, so-and-so came in this establishment the other day, and boy, did he really make a scene. Doesn't he go to, didn't he, didn't he, and it, they don't know how to word it right, doesn't he go to your church? <laughs> I, I almost said I don't have a church. And I, rightly, I don't have a church. It's not mine. It's the Lord's. But I, it's so embarrassing when you hear things like that. <laughs> not my church. <laughs> he doesn't go to my church. I just left it at that. But uh, any other comments? All right. I'm going to leave it at that, Ron. We've got about one minute. Yeah.